Hello, hello. All right. This will be my last one of the day. I'm going to read Pharaoh's Dream. So Joseph has now interpreted two dreams while in prison. And accurately, I might add, the person who lived forgot to mention it, though. That was the one thing Joseph asked for, man. What a butler. All right. So I'm going to read this from the New Living Translations just because it, it, the language would be way easier for everyone to follow if anyone ever watches these videos. Uh, Pharaoh's Dream, New Living Translation. Two full years later, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing on the bank of the Nile River. In the, this, in his dream, he saw seven fat, healthy cows come up out of the river and begin grazing in the marsh grass. When he saw seven more cows come up behind from the Ni them from the Nile, but these were scrawny and thin. These cows stood beside the fat cows on the riverbank. Then the scrawny, thin cows ate the seven healthy fat cows. At this point in the dream, Pharaoh woke up. Crazy dream. I wonder, you know, dream interpretation is in the Bible. It's all throughout. This is in every religion and everything throughout the world. And, you know, it's really frowned upon in modern Christianity because really it's like Joseph says all interpretation comes from God and there's a lot of people who just will use this for their own gain and then clearly you know they're not getting it from God and then comes an evil source and that sort of thing <clears throat> and it's not easy for most people to understand I get that and it's fine but know that dreams are an important thing especially those dreams that you can remember you know there's not very often do you remember dreams and not very often do you really think on a dream or does it stick in your head. Because even though it's a real thing and it's happened throughout history, you know, in the whole history of the Bible, there's only a few hand, you know, they talk about dreams, but it's not a lot. And every night you dream. So for the most part, most everyone, you, your dreams are just dreams. You know, and you may remember your dream, but you know it doesn't mean anything. There are dreams out there that people will have that you may have had that you know means something. There's something to it. It, it sticks with you. And you're thinking on it a long time, a long time. Now, I don't want you to get obsessed over a dream or anything like that because whatever happens, happens. But just know that if you trust in God, he may be trying to reveal something to you. And if you trust in him, he's more likely to then reveal it to you than if you just don't trust in him. All right, so this river, a couple, seven fat cows come out of the Nile. Awesome, healthy cows. Then seven scrawny cows follow them out. They stand next to each other. Then the thin scrawny ones eat the fat ones. Now, it's pretty obvious what the dream means when you know what happens later on, but we'll get into that. Verse 5. All right, so and that woke up the Pharaoh. So it's one of those dreams that sticks with you. It's one that woke him up and he remembered it and it was an intense dream. And you think about it, that's just a silly dream. There was something to it, though. He felt something more to it. It's just cows, you know, who cares? But it was the feeling that the dream gave him. All right, but he fell asleep again and had a second dream. This time he saw seven heads of grain, plump and beautiful, growing on a single stalk. Then seven more heads of grain appeared, but these were shriveled and withered by the east wind. And these thin heads swallowed up the seven plump, well-formed heads. Then Pharaoh woke up again and realized it was a dream. So again, another intense dream that wakes him up and he remembers it. And he feels this adrenaline rush. And again, why? It's wheat eating wheat. You know what? It's not that intense. But he feels something with it. The next morning, Pharaoh was very disturbed by the dreams. So he called for the magicians and wise men of Egypt when Pharaoh told them his dreams, I just want to go, I want to see what the King James calls magicians here. And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called out his magicians. Okay. And wise men of Egypt. When Pharaoh told them his dreams, not one of them could tell him what they meant. Finally, the king of, king's chief cupbearer spoke up. Okay, so let's rewind here. So he calls out the magicians, the wise men, the wizards, whatever. You know, men with weird hats and staffs and crazy robes and stuff like that. Snake charmers. And none of them can in interpret the dream. Now, it's so... Over it's overlooked if you just are reading it generally, but think about the circumstances that are leading up here. Well, first off, the cupbearer 
is the one that Joseph was able to interpret his dream. God gives Pharaoh a dream. God knows that Joseph is the only one who can interpret the dream. He knows that Pharaoh is going to need Joseph, which is going to bring Joseph out of prison. And he knows Joseph will work hard like he always does and will be seen by the Pharaoh for working hard and then be blessed. And eventually he becomes put over ruler, at basically like head counselor of for Pharaoh. And this is a spoiler alert. This is this chapter. And this is what happens. But to understand the magnificence and the fact that nothing falls under God's providence, everything falls under God's providence. There's a plan, and God will always work towards good. No matter how much bad stuff and evil th men do evil things towards Joseph, God's working towards a good, better life for him because he is a good servant of the Lord. Okay? This is something we all need to understand. You're going to have your downfalls. You're going to have your pitfalls and your hard times. And real, real, real hard times, they may be. But if you continue to work hard and trust in the Lord, you will rise above it. You know, And that doesn't even mean you'll ever be like financially super successful or anything like that. But your spirit, think about it. If you're, would you rather be the wealthiest person with depression or the happiest bum in the world? Like, think about it. How you feel inside is so important. And Joseph understands that no matter what, he's going to keep serving the Lord. And God's going to keep blessing him for it. But he'll do it even without the blessing. All right. <clears throat> the next morning, Pharaoh was... Oh, yeah. And so none of these idiots with their crazy hair and probably doing some form of drugs to interpret dreams, uh, none of them can figure it out. What I don't get is why doesn't just one of them lie, you know? That's why I'm not, why I'm really like, oh, I can't figure it out. It's too crazy. I'm surprised none of them just lied to impress Pharaoh. You know, like, ah, oh, this is what it means, but it won't, it won't come true for 700 years. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, good interpretation. You know, not very clever. Not even good at being evil, you know? <laughs> All right, verse 9. Finally, the king's chief cupbearer broke up. Today I have been reminded of my failure. He told Pharaoh, some time ago you were angry with the chief baker and me, and you imprisoned us in the palace of the captain of the guard. One night the chief baker and I found each had a dream, and each dream had its own meaning. There was a young Hebrew man with us in the prison who was a slave of the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams, and he told us what each of our dreams meant, and everything happened just as he predicted. I was restored to my position as cupbearer, and the chief baker was executed and impaled on a pole. So God knew that he, this cupbearer was going to have a dream. He gave this guy a dream. He knew that this would put him in a position to tell this story to Pharaoh. He was supposed to tell it right away, which we see right here. Finally, the king's chief baker, today I haven't been reminded of my failure. He failed to... Tell Pharaoh, which was the one thing Joseph asked him to do, and he forgot. I tend to think he forgot. You know, I don't think that he's like was mean. Like I'm not gonna tell. I think he was genuinely probably scared to say anything to Pharaoh for a while because Pharaoh just killed his buddy and let him out of prison. He almost died. He's probably like, oh, I'll just keep my nose down, you know, the head down and not say anything, and then eventually forgot. And then when this happens, he's reminded. And he feels compelled to tell Pharaoh. And again, God gave Pharaoh this dream. God put this cupbearer there. God put Joseph in this prison with these people and gave them the dreams. All this is working for a plan. He's such an awesome, like, talk about in like 560 chess that God's moving around here, man. All right, so yeah, this Hebrew boy interpreted our dreams and everything he said came true. All right, verse 14. Pharaoh sent for Joseph at once and he was quickly brought from the prison after he shaved and changed his clothes he went in and stood oh one more thing it says this cupbearer when he's telling pharaoh he says the chief first off he says you imprisoned us in the palace of the captain of the guard remember earlier i mentioned how potiphar threw joseph into like a pretty swanky prison really and this is one more, it's the palace of the captain of the guard. Yes, you're in prison, but it's not that rough of a prison because these are people like, again, this cupbearer was let back out and put back in service. They were put there during the investigation that was going on. It's not the worst prison in the world. 
And then also it goes on one that we had a dream. There was a Hebrew man with us in the prison who was a slave of the captain of the guard. Remember the captain of the guard, his palace, the captain of the guard had made uh, Joseph in charge of the whole prison. These guys weren't even really aware that he was a prisoner. They say, I mean, they might have been aware he's a prisoner, but they say he's a slave of the captain of the guard because he's not just a prisoner. He works for the captain of the guard. He's running the prison for the captain of the guard. Just more verification of what's mentioned earlier, you know. All right, verse 14. Pharaoh sent for Joseph at once, shaved and changed his clothes. He uh, went in and stood before Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream last night, and no one here can tell me what it means. But I have heard that when you hear about a dream, you can interpret it. It is beyond my power to do so, Joseph replied. But God, capital G, can tell you what it means and set it you at ease all right let's go to king james just want to see you real quick here it says in the king james it says god shall give pharaoh an answer of peace and this says put your mind at ease or set you at ease all right so again he's like i can't do it but god can do it you know what i'm saying he he doesn't want the glory again this just causes because it shows humbleness and people kind of respect humbleness that has power behind it you know and Joseph's humbleness towards God gives him the power of God. So people respect Joseph because of God, which gives him blessings in the world. It's so reciprocal. All right. So Pharaoh told Joseph his dream. In my dream, so he repeats the dream here. I was standing on the bank of the Nile, and I saw seven fat, healthy cows come up out of the river and begin grazing in the marsh grass. But then I saw seven sick-looking cows, scrawny and thin, come up after them. I've never seen such sorry-looking animals in all the land of Egypt. These thin, scrawny cows ate the seven fat cows, but afterwards you wouldn't have known it, for they were still as thin and scrawny as before. Then I woke up. Then I fell asleep again, and I had an, another dream. This time I saw seven heads of grain, full and beautiful, growing on a single stalk. Then seven more heads of grain appeared, but these were blighted, shriveled, and withered by the east wind. And the shiver, shriveled heads swallowed the seven healthy heads. I told these dreams to the magicians, but no one could tell me what they meant, mean. Joseph responded, both of Pharaoh's dreams mean the same thing. God is telling Pharaoh in advance what he is about to do. The seven healthy cows and seven healthy heads of grain both represent seven years of prosperity. The seven thin, scrawny cows that come up later and the seven thin heads of grain withered by the east wind represent seven years of famine. This will happen just as I have described it, for God has revealed to Pharaoh in advance what he is about to do. The next seven years will be a period of great prosperity throughout the land of Egypt, but afterward there will be seven years of famine so great that all the prosperity will be forgotten in Egypt. Famine will destroy the land. This famine will be so severe that even the memory of the good be known in the land even the memory of the good years will be erased for having two similar dreams it means that these events have been decreed by god and he will soon make them happen see what i mean about once you know what the the meaning of the dream you're like ah it's kind of obvious you know like if you're watching a movie you could almost predict what it meant you know you're like oh you know you ever watch a movie with someone who does that i tend to do that <clears throat> i know it's annoying but you're like, oh, okay, this makes a lot of sense. What I find so interesting here is, again, Pharaoh, Egypt, they don't follow God. And in a lot of ways, we'll notice that they do respect God. They kind of see that he's powerful and everything, but he's not their God. You know, first off, they worship many gods. So they're like, yeah, he's a great guy, but he's not the only one or sort of thing. So they do respect God. And a lot of these cultures even mention that he is the high God, but he's not their God which is weird to me, but they will even make mention of that. And the, so the Egyptians kind of, you know, they're already there. wasn't that long ago but that Abraham came through Egypt, you know. <clears throat> they're aware of, of these Hebrews. So Joseph, 
accurately interprets the dream. There's going to be seven years of famine, or seven years of prosperity, seven years of famine, and because you had two dreams, is decreed. Remember, I mentioned he felt it. He felt a powerful adrenaline wake up, but then immediately fell back asleep. Think about that. That's kind of crazy. If you have one of those adrenaline wake up dreams and you fall back asleep and have a very similar dream that also gets you going, and Joseph's like, he's decreed it. It's two in a row. Another thing, like I mentioned, the Egyptians don't follow or really venerate, worship God, at least not in the proper way, even if some, there might be some who do, you know, honestly, it's quite clear in the Bible that there are people outside of the seed of Abraham who follow God, it just doesn't really continue in their line very well, and so this may be, there may be some people there that do, but Pharaoh's not one of them, but Pharaoh is Pharaoh. And God loves all mankind. He doesn't want to see Egyptians. Any, he doesn't want to see people suffer. He doesn't want to see that. But there will be seven years of prosperity and seven years of famine. He's giving a warning in advance. For if those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, listen, let it be known that this will happen. Be prepared for it. And you go, well, why does God even have the famine? Well, God's always working for something. The famine brings... Hebrews into Egypt, which they need. It's all part of God's plan. It's all for a purpose. The famine is also weather changes. All right, we can't. It, we're in, who are we to say that like uh, you, if things were always prosperous, if the crops were always many and always many, and the weather is always the same, eventually that would mess something up. Like you don't understand the climatology in general. Things got to go through these changes and these. Uh, shifts for the earth to stay kind of healthy, you know, so God's giving him a warning. You're like, oh, why do you even give the famine? Shut up. He's giving you a warning ahead of time for the famine. Don't ask why there has to be a famine, you ingrate. <laughs> so he puts Joseph there so that he can prepare for this famine. Again, God will use people outside of his belief system, people who worship and venerate him, Pharaoh doesn't, he gives Pharaoh the dream so, so that Pharaoh can take care of his people, because his people are still God's people, they're still creations of God, and he wants them to not suffer so prepare for this because it's coming <clears throat> verse 33, therefore Pharaoh should find an intelligent and wise man and put him in charge of the entire land of Egypt, I like how Joseph Joseph's so ballsy. Like, remember earlier he was always bragging to his brothers about his dreams and how he's going to be like this awesome dude someday and they hated him for it because he was so cocky? He's kind of either cocky or just like so uh, – you know what? Oh, I don't want to offend anybody. But you know that slight autism that some kids have that make them very focused and very organized and very good – uh, but they're also they're very direct. It's kind of like that engineer sense of humor. You know what I'm saying? Like that dry sense of humor that a lot of engineers have. And they're very think about it. Joseph's very analytical. He's very good at managing things and uh, accounting and stuff like that. And he's also very blunt. <laughs> so I he, I think he's kind of got what is that type? A, I don't know the personalities, but that analytical blunt personality. Because listen to this. He just got freed from prison. And goes to Pharaoh, and immediately he tells him, not only does he tell him what his dream means, he, he gives hum humbleness, he humbles himself before God. You know, he's like, God will interpret your dream, not me. But uh, then he does it accurately, and without Pharaoh even waiting for Pharaoh to say a word, he then presumes to tell him exactly what he should do. So this is what you should do. The, the dream didn't tell him what he should do. Joseph's just like, this is what you should do. Uh, and, I th and he has this bluntness because he knows that what he's saying is coming from God. You know, he knows that God gives him knowledge, and so he's going to pass it on. But you'd have to admit, that's like some ballsy, he's just a ballsy guy to presume to talk to Pharaoh that way, right straight out of Egypt. Like, this is how you should run your country. This is what you should do. But again, he can do this because he doesn't look at himself as Joseph the prisoner. He looks at himself as giving the message of God. Therefore, Pharaoh should find an intelligent and wise man and put him in charge of the entire land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh should appoint supervisors over the land and let them collect one-fifth of all the crops during the seven good years. Have them gather all the food produced in the good years that are just ahead and bring it to Pharaoh's storehouse 
stored away and guarded so there will be food in the cities, that there will be enough to eat when the seven years of famine come to the land of Egypt. Otherwise, this famine will destroy the land. Good advice. Like, sounds like godly advice. You can't argue with that advice. Like, even if Pharaoh was kind of annoyed, the little prick, thinking he talked to me this way, if he had any brains in his boat, which he does, we we'll see, he would be like, uh, yeah, that makes sense. Like, okay, we're going to have seven years of prosperity. Instead of overindulging ourselves, let's make sure that we're collecting from every harvest during these seven years to then prepare in advance for the coming seven bad years. Always be prepared, you know? All right, this is a long chapter, by the way. Verse 37, Joseph's suggestion were, suggestions were well received by Pharaoh and his officials. So Pharaoh asked his officials, can we find anyone else like this man so obviously filled with the spirit of God? Ooh, I want to see what King James says there. Spirit of God. All right. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has revealed the meaning of the dreams to you, clearly no one else is as intelligent or wise as you. You will be in charge of my court, and all my people will take orders from you. Only I, sitting on my throne, will have a ranking higher, a rank higher than yours. I love how, you know, in all these stories, especially the Egyptians, they make mention to God, the Spirit of God, God. They're aware of God. They're aware, of, and even if you look into their history, they have so many similar stories to the ancient Hebrews, just kind of like from a different perspective. You know, just like the, the uh, Islam follows the same God, it's God of Abraham, and they do it in their own way. And that's the thing, you know, these Egyptians... They've broken off and they've turned God. In. They believe in this one true God, but now they also believe in these pantheons of gods and this drama that happens with them and the power structure. And you do this thing, and the, these gods want me to worship in this way. And you know, the Hebrews are like, no, it's just God. Just follow God. You know, <clears throat> and this happens all the time in churches. You see it. You know, it always goes back to the same source because God is the source. Uh, but they all kind of twist and find their own ways to worship in their own ways. And it becomes very perverted a lot of times over time because they want to – it's so easy for them to see glory in the earthly instead of only focusing on the heavenly, which is what God is in. But look at this. He says, since God uh, – can we find anyone else like this man so obviously filled with the spirit of God? Since God has revealed the meaning of the – he – sees that God is filled with, maybe he's using a different word, maybe he's using a word for gods, or maybe he even says raw or something, I don't know, and this is just the Hebrew translation, who knows, I don't know for sure, but they're aware of the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, they're aware of this Hebrew God and his power, even at this time, they know of this God, they may not think he's the most high, they may not think that he's their God, but they know that he's a God, <clears throat> all right so he's like since no one else is as filled with the spirit of god as this guy because all gods are venerated you know gods are respected you know it doesn't matter which god it is if you're still filled with the spirit of one of these gods you're let's make you the official like clearly you know you're the smart one you interpreted the dream you're obviously filled with, filled with the spirit of god this is a wise suggestion that you made all right, so you're going to be number two behind me, man. You're going to be my hand of the king. Game of Thrones reference. I'm getting good at those. All right. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the entire land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh removed his signet ring from his hand and placed it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in fine linen clothing and hung a gold chain around his neck. Then he had Joseph ride in the chariot reserved for the second in command. And wherever Joseph went, the command was shouted, Kneel down! So Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of all of Egypt. And Pharaoh said to him, I am Pharaoh, but no one will lift a hand or foot in the entire land of Egypt without your approval. You see, what you have to understand about, and this goes even all the way up to like England and stuff, the kings, the pharaohs, you know, the, the rulers, they saw themselves as a God figure. You know, they, they are a type of God. 
so the ruling wasn't really their thing necessarily pharaoh you know joseph and we see throughout the bible you're supposed to you get glory you humble yourself to god you humble yourself to god and it makes you a mighty powerful person because you humble yourself to god and the pharaohs and this stuff they kind of want to do the same thing you know they don't he doesn't want to rule necessarily he wants someone else to do that and he see he kind of sees the way joseph is towards god that's how they always wanted people to be towards them you know like okay you'll be my number two everyone will do everything that you say uh no one will move a foot without your approval and you is so but you're under me you know and joseph's fine with this he doesn't care because in his heart he knows he's under god he's he, he's going to do what's right in god's eyes even if pharaoh tells him to do something else so he's like yeah whatever you know i'll run the country and i'll run it well but if you tell me to do something evil then you know screw that <laughs> and but that's what pharaoh wants the pharaoh wants you know okay you i'll be he doesn't necessarily want to be Jacob or Joseph's God, he gets that he has glory from this God, but in this, that's the structure, if you will, that they have. They are the God, you humble yourself for me and I'll give you power, just like is the real God. You humble yourself for God and he'll give you power. Well, the Pharaoh's like, uh, I'll do it, you know. And J Joseph's like, whatever, you know, I don't care about your power, but like, I'll do it, I'll do the job. <laughs> All right. Then Pharaoh gave Joseph a new Egyptian name, Zaphanath Pania. Whoa, Zaphanath Pania. God speaks and lives is what that translates to. Cool. He also gave him a wife whose name was Asenath. She was the daughter of Potiphar, the priest of On. On. Helopolis. Greek version reads Helopolis. That's who On is. So Joseph has a wife whose name was Aseneth. She is the daughter of Potiphera, the priest of On. So Joseph took charge of the entire land of Egypt. He was 30 years old when he began serving in the court of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And when Joseph left Pharaoh's presence, he inspected the entire land of Egypt. And remember, it's not Joseph's line that uh, Christ comes from. And this bloodline people, which they're all over, you know, and I enjoy listening to the bloodline stuff. I really do. I don't see it as in the same light as a lot of other people, which I've talked about in the past, but it's still interesting. And you notice Joseph marries an Egyptian woman. So this, the you know, Nephilim or whatever people might say, this bloodline doesn't get tied in for any of you who believe that and i'm not making fun of people who believe that at all i'm sorry because uh, i do believe in nephilim and i believe in a lot of this stuff but the bloodline things i don't get as into i think it's a cultural thing i've made this very clear you know when the reason it's so wrong to marry this other woman is it's a whole cultural thing the woman's going to teach your children a different value system i don't know if that becomes a pro i don't it doesn't seem to become a problem with joseph's family uh maybe i haven't studied my bible enough and will notice that it does but i tend to think that joseph's glory for god and also his uh blessing from god gave him a woman who's more likely to come to his way of thinking who knows though she is the daughter of potiphar the priest of helopolis so she's dead i mean she's a totally different culture and this may be a main reason why their bloodline wasn't the you know where jesus was going to come from because so much of this other culture was going to be embedded and ingrained into the traditions of joseph's bloodline all right so he went to inspect the land as predicted for seven years the land produced bum why would it say like that as predicted for years the land produced bumper crops bumper a lot during those years, Joseph gathered all the crops grown in Egypt and stored the grain from the surrounding fields in the cities. He piled up huge amounts of grain like sand on the seashore. Finally, he stopped excuse me, keeping records because there was too much to measure. Uh, man, you got to know math. Like You got to know the square footage and the times. Don't worry about weight. It's all about the math, you know, so you can find the volume of it. That's how you measure it, dude. All right. 
What I'm picturing, first off, he's 30. I'm guessing he was a virgin up until then, so he, he was probably eager to get with his wife at that point. And then he, but he goes out to inspect. He's diligent. He goes right back to work, you know, always, always working. And I'm sure I'll probably, if I ever have any kind of an audience, people will say, some sort of troll mentioned anti-Semitic. Obviously, I'm not anti-Semitic. I'm reading the Torah right now. But uh, it's just funny to me because it's jokes, humor. How? What do you think was going th through their mind as Joseph, you know, he is collecting the crops during the time of, like, prosperity? So these – they were probably pissed at him. Like, obviously, Pharaoh gave him power, so they had to answer to him. But my guess is oh, there was a lot of people who saw the wisdom in what he was doing, but there was a lot of people who were getting freaking annoyed that this Jew was coming in and hoarding all the crops. What's he doing? He's hoarding it all. Why is he hoarding it? Isn't that such a like a typical stand-up comedian's Jew joke right there? And it's all throughout the Old Testament. Again, he's doing the right thing, but don't you can't you just see that there would be people saying that? You know, and obviously it wouldn't have the same connotation it does now because hebrew you know back then calling someone a hebrew they didn't have quite the reputation uh that they've established today but as far as joseph coming in and be like oh yeah that extra crop that because it's a prosperous year uh, pharaoh had a dream that it's gonna we're famine in seven years so we have to collect that extra stuff you can't make extra money on it and prosper personally we have to save it for the country you know they're probably like, screw this guy. And notice, there's going to be, this is the seeds that are set for the animosity that Egypt will eventually have, Egyptians will eventually have towards the Hebrews. This is just some seeds. Think about it. Most of the officials agree to the plan, but some of them now are getting sprinkled with, he's taking money, he's taking a grain. He's, this is our livelihood. This is how we prosper. What, what's he doing? What is this foreigner doing controlling our pros personal prosperity here? Yeah. It's just funny. You know, it's funny when you think about it. And it's easy to understand. Like, I'm a pretty conservative guy. I don't believe in big government. What would you do if the government was saying, like, we got to store all this food, blah, 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 blah. But at the same time, I see the intelligence of having food stored you know uh, that makes sense because you never know what's going to happen you don't know if your village is going to get raided village is going to get raided nearby and you have to go help them out you don't know if it's going to be a bad season the next year so it's always smart to do but at the same time you know big brothers coming in and telling me they're going to take my crop so it, you know this plants the seed of this foreign hebrew guy thinks he can tell us how to live which we'll see later on obviously when we get into exodus and everything all right so there's too much to measure. He does such a good job. He's hoarding all the crop, making some people mad, other people seeing it as wise. Sowing seeds of division, though. But Pharaoh sees the wisdom of it, because Pharaoh had the dream. He's all for it. He felt the dream. He felt, he realized that that was the dream. He knows it's going to come true. So Pharaoh, and Pharaoh's got his back, so everyone has to publicly support Joseph's idea and what he's doing. <clears throat> During this time, before the first of the famine years, two sons were born to Joseph and his wife, Eseneth, the daughter of Potiphera, the priest of On. Joseph named his older son Manasseh, which means causing to forget. For he said, God has made me forget all my troubles and everyone in my father's family. Joseph named the second son Ephraim, which means fruitful for he said god has made me fruitful in this land of my grief so he's you notice he's still venerating god in everything he does even though he's he's basically egyptian 17 years he spent under his father but now 13 years no more than 13 years because 13 years when he started working so now two years later it says doesn't it uh during this time before the first of the famine two sons so sometime in the next seven years so he's probably like 33 34 around this time so that means he spent half his life in both in egypt you know and the adult half so he's basically more egyptian as far as like the way he lives but he still still worships god and venerates god and holds to those values that god wants him to live by 
it doesn't matter what society you're living in. You can live in that society. You can enjoy their form of entertainment so long as it doesn't go against God. You can enjoy their form of games and sports and <clears throat> everyday living and water cooler conversations and all that stuff. But as long as you don't lose your core values and how God wants you to live. And God really doesn't ask for that much. You know, a lot of the laws of the Old Testament are still the same laws in other cultures for the most part. It's just different ways of honoring God's and... <clears throat> Joseph never stops honoring God, no matter what. Even though he's basically adopted the Egyptian culture or the Egyptian society, because I, I, I I'm going to use culture and society differently. You know, because culture I think incorporates religion a lot more. He's adopted their society, their everyday living, but he still is holding strong to his belief in God and his knowledge of how God wants him to live and what's what a moral is what's what's moral what's ethical what is virtuous all right <clears throat> two sons and notice he basically says he's forgotten his father's family he seems to have he realizes he probably will never see his father's family again and I think he's kind of accepted that you know at this point at last, the seven years of bumper crops throughout the land of Egypt came to an end. Then the seven years of famine began, just as Joseph had predicted. The famine also struck all the surrounding countries, but throughout Egypt there was plenty of food. Eventually, however, the famine spread throughout the land of Egypt as well. And when the people cried out to Pharaoh for food, he told them, Go to Joseph and do whatever he tells you. So with severe famine everywhere... Joseph opened the storehouses and distributed grain to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe throughout the land of Egypt. And people from all around came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe throughout the world. To buy grain. Notice that one, too. Again, shrewd. I mean, it's not wrong, necessarily, what he's doing. But he's making money off of it. They're not just giving the grain away. Maybe they are to some, you know, maybe if like you can prove you're Egyptian of this certain class, you know, you get free grain or something. But for the most part, he's buying it. Now, this being said, it would more than likely be, it wouldn't be like the peasants buying grain. It would be like a lord buying grain for his peasants, <laughs> you know, so the lord would come and pay for it for his peasants, you know, to keep them alive and that sort of thing. And not, so, <clears throat> but... He's making money off of it. Uh, I tend to look at it kind of like, ah, oh, geez, you know. But that's, again, again, I'm, don't put the Christ monarchy in all these people. Even as much veneration as I give to Joseph, he's not Christ. But also, you know, it's shrewd. That's what the Jews are taught to be. I mean, that's what we're, the Torah tells us is, you know, be shrewd. Be shrewd about how you operate these things, you know. Be kind of clever about it. So he's making money off of it. That always, you know, just as such like a bleeding heart Christian growing up in the church and everything, I was always like, you shouldn't, you know, especially as a little kid, like, why didn't he just give it away? You know, I see why not now, you know, smart move, but it's uh, still part of me has that like, should have just given it away, you know, especially to the Egyptians. I guess I get selling it if uh, people from another land come in, you know, because they weren't, didn't grow it. That's what I'm saying. So, like, people from another land come in and they need grain. You might, you know, sell it to them cheaply because they need it, and that's generous. But you'd still sell it to them because they weren't part of the growing the crop. The people who actually grew the crops that you collected, now you're now you're charging them. That seems low. <laughs> it really does. Shrewd, and it makes Pharaoh super pleased with him. But uh, yeah, that's the main thing at the end there that always got me. Is why didn't they give it away to the people? Especially, like I said, the people who grew it should get it for free. They shouldn't have to pay for it. All right, so that's Joseph working his way up to be the second in command of Egypt. Next, we're going to get into Joseph's brothers visit Egypt. And uh, just one thing I want to touch on that. I remember, wonder what's going through Jacob's mind. Because he's supposed to be blessed by God. And his people are supposed to be, you know, super uh, abundant as the stars in the sky and sand, but he loses his favorite son, and now his uh, the famine's hitting him in the land that he was told to go to. 
You know, I wonder what's going through Jacob's mind at this time. And Joseph's basically given up all belief that he's going to see his family again. And look at the road Joseph's gone through. What a crazy one. From interpreting these dreams to becoming second in command, head viceroy, hand of the king of the pharaoh, to planting the seeds of division that may that will later come from the exodus, and being shrewd in his all of his decision making. Really working up. Now again, I'm not trying to judge. I'm a lowly sinner. You know, I certainly wouldn't put myself in even nearly in the same class as any of the people in the Bible. But I will, I will say this. Not everything you read in the Bible, and I'll say this all the time, is exactly how you should live. As good of a person as Joseph is, it's not necessarily the, the right. And, there's, and there is gray area. Is it wrong that he sells this food at the end? No, it's not wrong. You know, it's not a sin or anything. But is it as good of a thing as if he would have given it away to the people who needed it? So that's the Christ right there. That's that's the thing. Like, what would Christ do? There's so many things in your day-to-day -day life where it's like it's not a sin. And you certainly shouldn't feel guilty about doing a certain thing. But at the same time, you should be aware that there's a better way. There's something better that you could be doing. Because we should always be striving to be better. And Joseph, yes, it gives him much credit to Pharaoh because they're going to get rich off of this. But again, they're getting rich off of collecting the grain for the famine and then charging the people who grew the grain during the famine. Uh, kind of sketchy. Again, this is one more reason why you should never put the Christ monarchy on everyone in the Bible. Even Joseph. And I've said in the last three videos in a row, Joseph is one of my favorite characters in the Bible. He's one of the people that I look to as someone who you, the average person, can really live a life like. You know, because uh, none of us can quite live up to Christ. We should always shoot for Christ, but you're going to fall short. And if you fall short and hit Joseph, you're like you're, that's a great shot, man. But again, not everything he does is exactly, you know, is Christ-like. All right. Long one, but I hope you are enjoying these Joseph ones, if anyone ever watches these, because it is just such a fun story, watching him go from high to low to high to low, <laughs> you know, and all the turmoil in between, and no matter what, he holds on to venerating God. And don't let this uh, thing stick with you of him selling food. I'm just pointing it out because it's kind of funny, you know, uh, that that's how he does it. Don't let that taint your idea that he isn't righteous man you know he's still a righteous man he's still trying to do everything in god's eyes that's right but and he probably in his point of view he sees this as right i'm sure he sees it as right to charge him so that they can you know <clears throat> pharaoh can make money because he works for pharaoh or whatnot it's not his grain necessarily it's pharaoh's grain so anyway i hope everyone enjoyed have a wonderful morning afternoon evening or good night god bless